Hello, I'm Raj and this is our paper on using motion for visual sound source localization. Now, what is visual sound source localization, one might wonder. If you have an image like this and the corresponding audio like this, it is to ask the question, which object in the image is making the sound? In this case, the unanimous consensus would be that it's the violin. Pretty easy, right? Let's try another one. Not so clear anymore. It could be one of the cars, it could be multiple cars, it could be all of them. But if this is all the information that we're dealt with, there is really no way to tell. So it seems like we need more information here. What if this was a video instead? Now it becomes a lot clearer which car was making the sound, which tells us that temporal context can be a very valuable source of information in such cases. Going back to the first example, the way we figured this out was that we heard the sound of a violin and we looked for something that looked like a violin in the image. The way this is done algorithmically is not that different. The common paradigm we see is that the image and the audio would be put through an encoder of some sort that would calculate an embedding. This calculation is done in a way that the audio and visual embeddings for similar objects are close together or highly correlated. For example, the audio and image of a violin would have a higher degree of correlation, while the same image would not correlate with the audio of, let's say, a fire truck. So these embeddings seem to have a semantic content. There is an implicit classification of sorts going on under the hood, which works pretty well for unambiguous cases like this. But here, the purely semantic embeddings fall short. This approach tells us that the object making the sound is a car, but if there are multiple cars, it says nothing about which one. Our work is primarily focused on urban scenes where cases like this are the norm. So we decided to explore the effects of adding temporal information as a cue for localization. The reasons why we want to focus on urban data are not just the applications it has in traffic monitoring, assistive devices, autonomous vehicles, etc. It's also the scientific merit of it. It's a very challenging scenario for visual sound source localization. To see how challenging, here we have an image from a commonly used benchmark dataset called VGG sound source on the left and an urban scene on the right. Now you might think that I'm exaggerating to make a point, which I am to some degree, but if you look at the distribution of sound sources throughout the entire dataset, we see that the gong is a remarkably representative image of the dataset. It seems like there's a pretty strong bias in the dataset for having large sound sources in the center of the image. And as in earlier publication documents, this is a pretty prevalent bias in most commonly used benchmarks. Single sound sources right in the middle of the image. Urban data, however, seems to be a bit more all over the place, encouraging further research on such datasets. We work with the Urbansys dataset that has video and stereo audio, and it has strong labels for both modalities. We use two baselines. One of them is our CGRAD, which is the state of the art for our dataset. And also we have a strong vision only top line, which is a pre-trained object detection model um, that we limit to only vehicles. And then we also filter out the stationary bounding boxes. This is a fully supervised method, while all our proposed methods along with our CGRAD are self-supervised. Moreover, this method systematically exploits all the biases of the dataset, making it a very strong benchmark to test our methods against. Our performance metric is what is standard in the literature. It's the intersection over the union of the prediction and the ground truth. And we use optical flow to encode motion information. Optical flow measures the pixel wise movement given consecutive frames of a video. And we try following three ways of incorporating it into the RC grad framework. We start with a simple heuristic and just element wise multiply the predictions of RC grad with optical flow. The rationale here being that optical flow would act as a filter and help cut down on false positives, while RC grad will exclude objects that move but don't make any sounds, like tree leaves. Then we use optical flow as an additional image channel and we train as we do in RC grad. And finally, we use a separate encoder for optical flow since it's a different modality than regular images. Now, let's see how the experiments went. To our surprise, while both the learning based methods where we use optical flow as a feature offer significant improvements over vanilla RC grad, the simple heuristic comes out at the top. Let's look at the results to try to understand why. In the first row, we can see that all our proposed methods ignore parked vehicles, but the predicted mask is a lot more precise with the heuristic. The learning based methods predict a larger, more diffuse mask, which looks good on visual inspection, but for a metric like intersection over union, this makes the union a lot larger, ultimately resulting in a lower IOU number. But if the optical flow calculation isn't so great, like in the second row, we see that the heuristic suffers and sort of underpredicts. Here, flow grad with the optical flow encoder 
learns to ignore the stationary vehicle while predicting a precise mask over the sounding car. Now, if the optical flow calculation gets any worse, that doesn't work out very well for our models. In the last row, there's a car parked at a signal with the engine on, and this violates the assumption that sounding objects are also moving objects. Here, all the optical flow based methods fail pretty dramatically. Which brings us to the limitations of our methods. Our methods heavily rely on optical flow, so if things are stationary but sounding, that is, they don't contribute to optical flow, or if there's a shaky camera, or if things are moving directly towards or directly away from the camera, optical flow no longer serves as a useful feature and actually even degrades performance. Another limitation is that our models predict heat maps while the ground truth has annotated bounding boxes. Since we use intersection over union, this incongruence possibly deflates our results. Also, since our methods are class agnostic, pedestrians are also recognized as sound sources. Now, future work for the limitations related to optical flow include using richer flow representations and using longer temporal windows for calculating optical flow. The rest isn't just a limitation of the method, but it's more about establishing a congruence between what we're training for and what we're evaluating for, so that we can get a better picture of how well our models are doing on what we want them to do. Thank you very much for your attention. You can check out the paper for more details, and the source code for this is openly available for you to play with. And any comments and feedback are very welcome. Thank you.